All right, everyone, welcome to the second half of the 5-2 lecture or second, third, or whatever it's going to end up being. Uh, so in the last lecture, we talked about uh, the uh, association and commissural uh, tracts, just kind of in theoretical terms, but there are specific named association and commissural tracts and other structures that we need to identify and talk about before we get any more in-depth about the functionality of the cortex. Uh, so... Uh, here on this slide, I'm showing you some of these specific named tracts, uh, association tracts. And in particular, um, we have tracts that connect the parietal cortex to the frontal cortex so that information about things, uh, the location of things in the space relative to your body uh, can be processed by your frontal cortex. And so you can make decisions about objects that are in your awareness, your spatial awareness, and how to interact with those things. Uh, there are uh, arcuate uh, fasciculus uh, fibers uh, connecting the temporal and the frontal cortex. The temporal cortex is the what cortex. Uh, so uh, the temporal cortex is identifying things and describing to your, your cortex their, their purpose, their functionality, what they are, what their name is. Uh, so uh, this is giving information to your frontal cortex again. So you can, uh, so your frontal cortex can make decisions about uh, the things that it's aware of in its visual fields. Uh, so that's the arcuate fasciculus. Uh, we also have the uncinate fasciculus from the temporal pole to the orbitofrontal gyrus. So uh, information from the amygdala, the hippocampus, the uh, the, um, um, the piriform cortex, uh, those, that sort of information about memory is sent to the orbitofrontal cortex and the frontal, uh, and the frontal cortex, uh, again, to provide information about objects that you've encountered before and how those objects you encountered before impacted your existence, uh, you know, kind of in a uh, historical and emotive way. The optic radiations can be considered a type of uh, uh, association tract, uh, but in particular, the connecting tracts between the gyri within the cortices are definitely association tracts, and these are short unnamed tracts. For instance, the connections from the primary visual cortex to the secondary visual cortex are going to be the, from these, by these short unnamed tracts between gyri. Now we, we have uh, commissural tracts, and again, these are crossing hemispheres to send information to the opposite hemisphere. They send information to basically the same location, but in the opposite hemisphere. So from, for instance, uh, one amygdala to the other, or from one temporal cortex to the other temporal cortex, a specific region in the temporal cortex. And these, uh, these tracks are called, we have, of course, our main landmark, the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum has a number of different regions within it. It has a rostrum or a nose to it, the most anterior portion. Uh, so that's the orbitofrontal portion. I think this slide, yes. So the uh, rostrum, the orbitofrontal portion, the genu, the bend of the corpus callosum, uh, and the body for the uh, motor and sensory information crossing, uh, and then the splenium posteriorly. So that's for the occipital and the parietal cortices. Uh, and we also have the anterior commissure, which you can see here in the coronal view, connecting the two amygdalae together. Uh, and information from the olfactory bulb also travels through the anterior commissure. So our sense of smell is uh, highly uh, involved in both memory and emotion. So our olfactory bulb sends that information directly to the amygdala uh, and the hippocampus. Uh, so we've talked before about the posterior commissure, and we talked about its function with the pupillary light reflex. Posterior commissure, though it's named a commissure, is not considered a cortical tract. It's not in the same category because it is only sending information between the uh, small tectal uh, regions in the posterior midbrain. It does not have any information from cortical uh, neurons. Uh, 
And then, of course, we have projection tracks. Uh, these tracks are the corticospinal tracks going to the spinal cord, as well as the corticobulbar or corticopontine, sometimes called corticonuclear. These uh, corticopontine are sending information to pontine nuclei. And these pontine nuclei are, for instance, facial motor nucleus or trigeminal motor nucleus. These are the lower motor neurons for the head. Uh, so uh, just be aware that that tract has a different name because it has a different target. It's not going to the spinal cord. It's going to the pontine nuclei or uh, the bulbar nuclei. And uh, then corticostriate. So these are fibers from that uh, layer 6 fusiform cell heading down into the striatum uh, to inform the striatum and the thalamus about information that we intend that's in our cortical awareness, our conscious awareness. Next, let's spend a little bit of time on these allocortical structures. Uh, in particular, uh, we're going to talk about the amygdala. Uh, and so these bilateral structures uh, process uh, emotional events and, and process uh, the consolidation uh, in memory of emotional events. So for instance, uh, something frightening happens to you, a saber-toothed tiger actually jumps out at you. Uh, that is a very emotional event and the amygdalus, uh, the amygdalae will relay that information and stimulate those neurons that are firing during that event so that you can recall that event later and uh, understand uh, you know, the magnitude of that event. So not just emotion, but also memory and how emotion impacts your memory. And remember, these, the amygdalae are connected to the, uh, the uh, septofrontal nuclei, and those septofrontal nuclei are connected to the habenula. So all of this emotive motion, um, emotion memory uh, type of uh, structures are connected. Um, okay, so the amygdala, you think about it, you have an emotional event, your heart starts racing, your pupils uh, dilate, things happen autonomically in your body. And so the amygdala have to be connected to the autonomic system, have to be connected to the hypothalamus. And in fact, they are via a uh, connection called the stria terminalis. I'm not sure, do I have it? Okay, uh, and the stria terminalis here, connecting amygdala to the uh, hypothalamus. So what happens when the amygdala are stimulated, uh, like uh, with a stimulatory secretory tumor, or with a, uh, like an experimental condition with an electrode in the research laboratory. <clears throat> and what happens there is sham rage. It's rage response without any emotional stimulus occurring in the environment. So you, um, uh, you know, uh, sham rage. Okay. Uh, what happens when we have a lesion of this? Um, what happens if we don't have an amygdala? It's been damaged. It's gone. Well, what happens is placidity. These individuals don't have any response to emotional stimuli. They don't have a, um, a hypothalamic, an autonomic response. Everything that happens, they just take at an even keel. It just doesn't matter to them because there's no emotional impact to what's going on. Uh, so this uh, kind of placidity, uh, this damage to the amygdala is called kluver busey syndrome. And it's also associated with a uh, kind of hyper-orality and a hypersexuality, And that's because these individuals not only don't feel fear of the saber-toothed tiger, but they don't have social compunction either. There's no uh, socially negative impact. Uh, they don't feel that social uh, stigma when they do something that might be, you know, against social norms. So they're always sticking everything in their mouth uh, you know, just kind of tasting everything, feeling everything. And they also have uh, a lack of compunction about sexuality. So uh, they might do sexually inappropriate things, uh, you know, and, and um, you know, not, not feel bad about it at all. Uh, so moving on, uh, septal nuclei. Septal nuclei are a uh, reinforcement for uh, reward, a reward um, 
type of thing, uh, especially during socialization. Uh, so it has projections, especially to the hypothalamus and hippocampus because it's involved in memory and with this autonomic response. And then we have the basal nucleus of Maynard. The basal nucleus is the acetylcholinergic uh, center of the brain, and it sends those acetylcholinergic projections throughout the cortex as well as to the hippocampus. So the, this helps us focus our attention on things that are, are in our cortical conscious awareness. When something's important, uh, when there's a repeated stimulus, then the acetylcholine levels uh, will, will trigger a memory formation of that web of neurons that are firing at that moment. So basically, uh, acetylcholine is just amping up those neurons' ability to wire together. So neurons that wire together fire together, but when acetylcholine hits a neural synapse, a neuron that's synapsing and firing, then it increases the stimulation of that neuron, makes that, um, that cortical awareness from that neuron heightened, and so that connection increases, and that is memory formation via a process of long-term potentiation. And so, uh, also connecting to the hippocampus, which does a similar thing, which uh, consolidates that, that network of neurons that's firing at a moment so that that network fires together again later on, and that's memory recall. Uh, so when, uh, in, for instance, dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, acetylcholine uh, can, you know, is commonly uh, deprecated, it's decreased, in uh, dementia. And so that means these people with dementia have less ability, less attention, less ability to focus on things, and less of, of an ability to form memories, as well as less of an ability for those connections that are made already to fire again, because uh, the acetylcholine is not there to trigger those connections. <clears throat> So keeping on with the theme of the uh, allocortical structures, of course, we have the hippocampus, important for consolidating those memories. Again, memory is not stored in the hippocampus. It's not stored in the parahippocampal gyrus, uh, but it triggers the formation, the connection of those uh, neural connections that are firing at any given moment. And then the, uh, so we've already talked about the fornix and how that uh, connects to the hypothalamus, the mammillary bodies, as well as has projections to the septal nuclei and the thalamus. Uh, and then the perihippocampal gyrus. Uh, so this uh, perihippocampal gyrus inputs into the hippocampus. It has other, uh, the interrhinal cortex. And so all of these functions of the perihippocampal gyrus, important for deciding which memories to encode, whether something is novel or, uh, you know, common. And so that all goes into the, um, the decision-making that the hippocampus makes as to what's important and what's worth remembering. And of course, a lesion to parahippocampal gyrus hippocampus will result in anterograde amnesia, the inability to make new memories. <clears throat> so Alzheimer's disease, uh, some of the uh, common traits of Alzheimer's disease uh, from a histological standpoint, is an aggregation of that beta amyloid plaque protein within the hippocampus. And then that spreads through those connections, the hippocampal connections, to the rest of the cortex and ends up blocking the activity of those neural connections, uh, which is the memory itself. So early dementia, uh, the neural connections are still there because the beta amyloid hasn't uh, inhibited and blocked those synapses from functioning, uh, but eventually in, in later uh, stages that does occur. Uh, so there's the entorhinal cortex within and then the cingulate gyrus that we've already talked about. Uh, so critical in uh, attention and uh, error correction. Uh, so making sure, you know, if we do something and then it results in a negative consequence, the cingulate cortex is going to give us that sense of the negative consequence and make us remember that negative consequence so that we correct it the next time. Um, so um, 
Again, we talked about the Stroops task. You can look up tests on, you know, on the internet and, and try to you know, take a Stroops task and see how quickly you can do it uh, and how accurately, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can get a sense of how well your cingulate gyrus is activating. And in fact, there are populations of people uh, who have anatomically smaller and less active uh, cingulate gyri. And so they're not as impacted by, uh, you know, uh, uh, conveying, uh, you know, uh, inaccurate information or, uh, you know, uh, doing poorly on a test doesn't impact them. Uh, so uh, the accuracy of their information, you know, isn't, isn't critical to their sense of processing that information. <clears throat> but uh, also involved in placing attention on these types of emotionally impactive uh, events. And then, of course, uh, the cingulate gyrus is connected to things. It's connected to the hippocampus and the parahippocampus so that you can form these memories. And that connection is through a white matter tract uh, called the cingulum. So uh, that's it for this part of 5-2. Uh, I'll take a break before going into part three. Thanks for listening.